All right. On behalf of the Tug Hill Commission, Region 6 of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Hamilton, Herkimer and Jefferson, Hamilton, Herkimer, Jefferson and Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation Districts, welcome to the fifth, fifth of seven presentations in the virtual Black River Watershed Conference. Today, back by popular demand is Dr. Chris Eby, who will present Geology of the Black River Part 2. All right. There are only two remaining webinars, which will be held next Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the commission's website. Um, and you're all muted right now to reduce background noise, but I promise this will be interactive. Um, please use the chat box to type questions and answers and we'll answer um, uh, on the fly. So without further ado, oh, first let me say hello to Nichelle Swisher, to Tom Boss, to Katie Malinowski, who are, uh, along with myself, I'm Jennifer Harville, we're original members of the technical advisory team when the watershed plan was created. So again, now without further ado, uh, here's Dr. Chris Eby. Hi, um, so thank you very much, Jen. Uh, I'm very delighted to be back here. Well, not actually back physically anywhere uh, <laughs> because, you know, this is once again remote. So, Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Black River and the Black River watershed and its geologic history. And I've decided to keep it, the, the actual PowerPoint slides pretty short because I wanted to focus on your questions, your ideas, and your thoughts. So I just want to check really quick. Um, I'm going to be trying to watch the chat as much as possible while I'm presenting. I'm gonna try and do both at the same time. I should be pretty comfortable with it because that's how I teach. But I would love to see in the comments, just a hi, just to see that everybody's there, everybody can comment, um, that you're able. So I'd love to see a couple of highs in there. I see Karen and Emily and Michelle have all said hello already. So hi to y'all. So anybody, everybody else? Hi, Linda, Paul. Paul here, wonderful, wonderful. And if you can let me know where you're from or what group you're with, that would be great too. So, hi Kate, very welcome, welcome aboard. Good to see you, Katie too, well, see you. Uh-huh, um, from Tug Hill. Sue, uh, CC, -E oh, oh, um, Cornell Cooperative, Exp oh, I know you, Sue. I know you, Sue, well, hi, Paul. So, anybody else? Want to say hi? Oh, Linda, uh, former commission now with the Tug Hill Tomorrow Land Trust. Awesome. And I know I've met a lot of you in a variety of different contexts. So you grew up near Dadville. See, I don't, so I'm not a New York native. I am actually a transplant from Chicago. So I don't, a lot of the, a lot of little towns, I don't always know. So I'm not even quite sure where, um, where uh, Dadville is. I know where Turin is. Welcome, Joe. Uh, from Watertown, New York, DEC's uh, Great Lakes program. Yeah, Emily gave a great presentation not that long ago. And I want to give a shout out. Um, the uh, Watershed program is doing a lot of really good presentations right now. So Paul, oh, it's in Lowville. Thank you. That kind of gives me a little bit of a better sense of where you are. Greetings from Boonesville. Welcome, Robert. Uh, and if there's anything that you'd like me to call you while you're in the chat, you know, if you have a preferred nickname or preferred name that doesn't show up, I know you can change it on your Zoom, but um, I always like to know um, where you are. Oh, currently living in Houston. I've got a student down there. So we're doing historical geology and I'm gonna be sending him outside and it's kind of a trip because, you know, I'm gonna have to actually, he's not actually in Houston, he's just in Texas. I was like, I forget what proportion is of the continental United States, but it's absolutely enormous state. So he's actually um, in the El Paso area and I don't know Texas geography very well. So, but um, very cool. So hello, Houston, um, down here in Watertown. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna try and share a screen over here and let's see now i'm more used to a system called collaborate so let me go ahead and actually go ahead and give you a little introduction who i am and um why they've invited me here well i don't know why they've invited me here i feel always really lucky when anyone invites me anywhere to talk about rocks 
because I absolutely love to talk to people and I absolutely love to talk about rocks. So when I can talk to people about rocks, it's just a win for me. So my background is, like I said, I was originally from Chicago. That's where I got my bachelor's and my master's. And then I spent some time in Europe and that's where I got my PhD before coming back here. I taught at a couple of different universities, University of um, Denmark. I've taught um, in Europe, not the Denmark in New York. Um, I've taught uh, at University of Illinois at Chicago and I ended up here at Jefferson Community College back in 2013 and I've never been happier. I love my job because I get to see a real segment of the community and communicate a passion to them, especially a lot about local geology. I really love local geology and enjoy learning about local geology. So don't get too far from the computer, it gets hard to hear you. Thank you. So I do have a tendency to wander. That's what I naturally do in the classroom. So if there's at any point that you can't hear me particularly well, uh, let me know, I'll just get louder. No, I'll try to stay a little bit more still. So I do have to reach around because I do have rocks that I would love for you guys to actually take a look at here. So we'll be popping in and out of the presentation at different points. So I do want to do a flashback. Well, you're not be saying like, why isn't she doing it in the regular mode? Usually presentation mode is, um, uh, when you do it in presentation mode, it has the big slide and it fills up and you can't see this over here. But the reason that I'm doing this is because I want to interact with you. I want to get your questions. And the great thing about doing it in this mode is that if you have a question, I can grab a picture from the internet and I can put it right in that slide. It'll be recorded part of the presentation. So I don't want you to be at all afraid to ask questions or ask me to elaborate on any other points that I'm talking about. Um, like I just said, I kept the slideshow itself pretty thin to give you guys an opportunity to ask me more questions about the particular topic that should interest you. So if we get into the way back um, machine, that's actually, I don't know, extra points. Who, who knows where that cartoon is from? Just really quick. Anybody recognize that cartoon? I'll give you a second. So going back to June 4th, 2019, which is the last time we had Black River Watershed Convent, that Mr. Peabody, excellent, Linda, excellent, Sue, Dexter's Lab, excellent. So yeah, so this is back from the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. So if we go back to June 4th, 2019, um, for the part one of the presentation, let's go ahead and recap really quickly where we've been. You may not remember, uh, June 4th, 2019, it was this crazy time when we didn't wear masks and we weren't afraid, like, like people weren't, you know, completely freaked out by somebody sneezing. So back during those long, long days ago, we divided the Black River Valley into two parts, Black River Watershed into two parts. And to the northern and eastern section of the watershed and the southern and western portion of the watershed. And the portion that we covered last time was the northern and eastern. Why? Because that section right there by itself is absolutely loaded with history. So in our focus in part one, we were looking for the, at the portions of the Black River watershed system, the geologic history of those portions that overlapped with the Adirondack Mountains and the Adirondack region. So couple of things that we took as a take home from last time, the north and east of the river, that's where we're going to see the oldest rock, including some of the oldest rock in the world. So that very, very old rock is 2.5 billion years old or older. It's a part of the continental crust and even deeper. So if you go further out into the Adirondacks, you can actually see parts of the mantle exposed, which is pretty cool. Um, I just did a video for my students where, where we can actually see a little parts of the mantle sticking up in the Adirondacks. So that continental crust is exposed in that area. So that's the old, some of the oldest rocks on earth because they're some of the first rocks that, are, that were formed on earth during the earliest portion, latest portion of the Archean and earliest portion of what's called the Proterozoic. Now I throw those terms around a lot, Archean, Proterozoic, Okay, we'll be going over reviewing Earth's calendar in just a few minutes. So if you're sitting there going like, I don't know what you're talking about, let me give you some numbers. So in the Adirondacks, the big key with the Adirondacks is that they're new mountains made from old rock. 
So you can see really, really ancient rock in the Adirondacks, about 2.5 billion years old to about 1.1 billion years old. That stretches from the formation of the continents to the formation of the supercontinent Rodinia, okay, which is where we had this massive continental collision and um, and we have the formation of the gneiss that we see and the various um, gneissic granites, gneissic diorites, and uh, uh, meta and orthrocytes of the uh, Adirondack Mountains. Those are all different names for different forms of metamorphic rock. So that includes things like the granite from the continent formation and that gneiss from that supercontinent formation. So just as a quick review, what's maybe maybe it isn't a review maybe it's new material we're going to go ahead and test i'm going to want you to put on your own little way back helmets and remember back to your geology class that you probably took at some point in your college education or at least if you're from the state of new york you may have had some geology in high school or junior high what are the three types of rocks and how are they made does anybody know what's one type of rock Give you a hint should be pretty easy at least ones on the screen of the three igneous excellent where does igneous rock come from jen and we got sedimentary sue excellent formed from erosion and deposition excellent emily and then we got metamorphic igneous and sedimentary from paul so where does metamorphic rock come from you guys know that mm -hmm. Heat and pressure, excellent, excellent. Metamorphic can come from volcanic activity usually. And yeah, Amy's got it, heat and pressure, you've got it. So we got that heat and that squeezing. Whereas igneous rock is cooled molten rock. So when we're talking granite, we're, these are all, the Adirondacks re represent some hot, hot rock. We've got this, this big block of granite, which is an igneous rock that formed when the earth's outside shell was still kind of squishy and molten. And as it cooled, it formed these big crystals. Okay. Let's a little granite right here. Usually I'd hand that to you. That's one of the things I miss from Zoom. I wish I could hand it through the camera. Maybe in the future you'll be able to touch it. But it's a very familiar rock to most people around here. Now, this is the rock that collided to form Rodinia got squished and it had a lot of heat and pressure from, from a massive continental collision and formed the gneiss. And if you dig down deep enough anywhere in New York state, you're gonna find gneiss and granite in either or some combination of the two. So we often talk, refer to like gneissic granite, which is granite partially turned to gneiss or Granitic gneiss, which is, it's almost all the way to gneiss, but it's not quite, it's still got some granite, granite features left in it. So that's kind of a recap, very quick recap of the history of that portion of the Black River. We also discussed an important feature of the Adirondacks and how the Adirondacks form. So once again, this is a little bit of review here. That rock is really old, but the Adirondacks are really young. The Adirondacks are only about 5 million years old. And how they formed isn't really well understood. But the basic idea is that it's a little like a lava lamp. There's a pillow, a bloop from the mantle that's lower density than the surrounding material. So it has a tendency to float. And that floating mantle is basically pushing up a blister that is the Adirondacks. So this old deep rock was uncovered when the glaciers basically carved into the Adirondacks. So does anybody recognize that photo in the background? All my backdrops for this presentation are photos of places I enjoyed spending time. So does anybody recognize that photo in the background? Good guess, Emily. So good guess. Could be Mount Arab, a little bit closer. It's around Old Forge. Good guess too, Nichelle. It's actually, this is, it's even small. It's a small little fun mountain. It's Bald Mountain. So this is Bald Mountain. 
Um, um, I like to do a winter hike. And one of the fun things about Bald Mountain is that you can very clearly see the features of glaciation. So this ridge in the background, see this is one of the advantages of doing this without having it in slide view is I can move this out of the way a little bit. If you look into the background over there, look over, oh, my window's so cluttered with chats and everything. We can see that this is a long ridge. This is an aerate right here, which is a long ridge formed by two glacial valleys. So there was a glacier that traveled over on this side over here and a glacier that traveled over here and it created this sharp mountain ridge over here. Now, that's a pretty good recap, whirlwind tour of what we have covered before. I wanted to get a picture of the kinds of things that we looked at before, because that's really the starting place of where we're going now. So right here, I have an example of the uh, one of the ways that we can represent the geologic time scale. And once again, a reminder from your geology class back in the day, the geologic time scale is basically Earth's calendar. And just like a regular calendar is broken into months and weeks and days, Earth's calendar is further subdivided into eons, eras, and periods. Where eon is the larger unit, eras, and then it, that eon is subdivided then into eras, and that era is subdivided into periods. So where we're gonna be spending time today, most of our time today is in a different place than we did last time. So in part one, I have those areas outlined in blue right here, okay? Where we're going in part two is outlined in, in red. So last time we spent a lot of time in a time period known as the Proterozoic, a very exciting time period where we had, um, continents forming and we had Rodinia. We spent a lot of time in Rodinia and that's where I've highlighted mostly where we have Rodinia and Snowball Earth, which is the Neo-Proterozoic. Um, now we're moving forward in time to the era known as the Paleozoic. And that's when things get exciting because that's when we first start seeing evidence of complex life. Things with shells, things that burrow, things that crawl, things that poop. The Phanerozoic, which is the eon we're in, and the Paleozoic, everything underneath here down to probably, now this is a huge matter of science debate, whether it's here or back to here, this whole big region in here had life, but it was all very simple single-celled things like cyanobacteria. Basically picture very simple pond scum floating in the ocean. Nothing with guts, nothing that could crawl, Nothing that was really a hunter, nothing like that. It isn't until the Cambrian that we start seeing this great explosion of life. And that dramatically changes the earth in a couple of ways. One, it creates fossils, which everybody thinks is kind of cool, including me. I did a bunch of my work in paleontology. Um, but another thing is it changes the chemical behaviors of the earth, what we call earth's biogeochemical cycles. That means life, chemistry, geology, life chemistry, rock cycles, okay? Because many of the rocks that we see are actually made from living things. So we start seeing the deposition of things like limestone being really well widespread. Start seeing the deposition of things like, in other words, the formation of things like chert. So we're gonna take a look at some of these events. We're gonna take a look at some of these ecosystems and really get a good idea of what we're looking at when we look at the southwestern portion of the Black River watershed. So I want to pause right here. Anybody have any questions so far? Because I covered a good amount of information in a few minutes. All right, I will keep right on trucking then. So we're going to get in our way back machine again. We're going to set the dials for the Ordovician. And the Ordovician is a time period running from about 440 million years ago to about 500 million years ago. It's not the earliest period in the Paleozoic. That's actually the Cambrian. So we're not looking at the very start of life. 
but we're looking at the, some of the first really complicated ecosystems back during the Ordovician. Now I've shown this map a couple of times during my presentations, it is actually earlier in the presentation, I realized I've never really stopped and explained what you're looking at. I mean, you might be looking at it and being like, that, that is fantastic abstract art right there. I love those shapes. Those are some great colors. So let's add a little bit of definition to what we mean by the colors we see in this map. So first of all, what this is, is a bedrock map. A bedrock map doesn't represent every piece of rock that is there. What it represents is the bedrock, the rock that's attached to the attached to the crust, that's the topmost layer that's actually at the surface. So if you dug down to the sediments, through all the sediments, okay, in other words, all the dirt, we like to say sediments or soil, all the dirt, if you dug down in the dirt and you hit rock, these are the different kinds of rocks that you will see in these different areas. So orient yourself, over here is Lake Ontario, over here is Watertown. Now this big lump right here of weird shaped rock right here, you know, the brown and the beige and the kind of orangey with the little speckles in it, that's the Tug Hill Plateau. So this Tug Hill itself is actually made out of a very different type of rock, which we'll talk about again in just a few minutes. Now, if we break these different rock types up, this blue stuff that runs all the way, basically it runs from um, all the way from up here towards you know, Cape Vincent and that kind of stuff down to Henderson Harbor and even south of that along the edge of Lake Ontario, basically all along the Black River Valley, all through Lowellville, for example, all of this blue stuff, this is all limestone. Now this light brown stuff in here, this is the shale you see in Whetstone Gulf. And actually it's so distinctive, it's actually the name of the formation is Whetst <laughs> the Whetstone Gulf Formation and refer to it as Whetstone uh, Shales. So we're looking at the Whetstone Shales there when we're right along this era edge right here of the Tug Hill Plateau. And then when we get towards the top, we have the sandstone. And this is the Oswego sandstone named after Oswego where it outcrops over here. Uh, it's basically the lid, the top on top of the Tug Hill Plateau. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go on a imaginary hike. We're gonna be walking basically step-by-step step up Tug Hill from the bottom of the Black River Valley. Now, as we're walking, we'll talk about we're, how we're moving in different ways in time and space. So a big key to remember is that as you're climbing up Tug Hill, you are going forward in time. So you're going from approximately 465 million years ago, which is the middle of the Ordovician, all the way up to about 440 million years ago, which is the very late end of the Ordovician, almost into the Silurian. So the first step that we're looking at is the limestones of the Black River Valley. And this is actually, this right here, this is a picture taken on a beautiful day out when I was basically playing in these rapids with a bunch of people out at uh, Great, Great Bend area, DeFerriot area. Um, and these limestones cover Watertown, Lake Ontario coast from St. Vincent to Henderson Harbor, Deer River area, Port Leiden area, all of these areas, those are fundamentally the same limestones. Well, not all exactly the same formation. There's actually quite a few formations in that range, but they're all of a middle Ordovician age. In other words, they're all approximately somewhere in the neighborhood of about 460 million years old. And they're all going to have very similar uh, living things inside them. In some cases, the diversity will change, which ones you see more predominant, whether you see brachiopods or nautiloids or that sort of thing um, is going to change over time. But overwhelmingly, it's going to be, they're going to be much more similar than they are different from one another. 
So this is the world when the limestones along the Black River Valley formed. So here we have an imaginary outline of North America. Now this is extremely imaginary because there are entire portions of this, this continent that haven't formed yet. For example, Great Lakes were formed by the most recent glaciation. They were not there. This Cordillerian mobile belt right here, this whole section of the Western United States and Western Canada, that slammed into us much later. This Awacha Appalachian mobile belt, that also slammed into us much later. So basically we're looking at just the core of our continent known as Laurentia, which basically encompasses this material up here. Another thing that's kind of funky about this map, this diagram, is that it's not a realistic projection of the orientation or location of North America back during the time when these limestones formed. So if I go to the next slide over here, this is more accurate. So right here, you can see right here, and it says paleo equator, right? So this paleo equator is exactly what it sounds like. This is the ancient equator of Earth. So our continent was kind of laying on its side on the equator. And another thing that we notice is that most of it wasn't above water. Basically, we had, anybody recognize that film? It is a terrible film. What movie is that? Anybody recognize that? Water World, excellent, Jen, excellent, Emily, excellent, Linda, excellent, Amy, good job. So that is a terrible Kevin Costner film, uh, but it's a good illustration of, of, of what we would see during the Ordovician, because just like in Water World, what's the problem with Water World? What's the theme? Why is the world covered with water in Water World? All the what happened? Well, the glaciers melted, right? So that's the whole theme of the movie. Maybe I saw it a little bit more recently. So I actually genuinely love terrible movies. So um, we have this kind of, you know, we have basically a water world that's very similar to this, this environment that they imagined for the movie. We have very few glaciers during this time period. So water levels of the ocean are really, really, really high. And most of North America is actually covered by water. So what these little patches represent are basically back during the Ordovician, little islands. And this red dot here represents the location of Watertown. So we see that we have some important features down here that we're gonna zoom in on. Mostly what we call here is the Taconic Highlands. So right now we're in the middle Ordovician about 465 million years ago. Now, what's it like? What looks like, what's it like at the equator? Okay, look at these islands. These islands are just off of the equator. It's a little bit like the Caribbean islands. What are the Caribbean islands like? Right, they're super warm and they're super tropical. And we see a really similar environment during the Ordovician, a very, very close environment to that warm tropical environment that we see today along the equator and along islands. Because once again, this whole area, Eastern continental United States, basically this portion of the seaboard was, was an island, was a, basically a long island along, along the coast. Now, all this area here where the land is just underwater is very, 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 very shallow. That creates ideal conditions for coral reefs and coral reef environments. So there's this whole idea of convergent evolution, that similar creatures will evolve similar solutions to a problem. So for example, in this case, these coral reefs, as we're going to talk about in a moment, aren't quite like the coral reefs. This is a picture of the coral reefs, modern coral reefs today with fish floating around in it and that sort of thing. Um, this is the same kind of structure that we see today just off the coast. Those same kind of ecosystems evolved back 
a um, about 460 million years ago. Actually, they even evolved earlier than that. Those sorts of ecosystems are about 520 million years old. But the creatures that lived in them weren't quite the same as the creatures we, we see today. So we're going to see as we move forward in time through the late middle to the late Ordovician. So we're starting at the bottom of the valley in the earliest time period. And then we're moving towards the late Ordovician. We're starting 465 million years ago, and we're moving forward about 15 million years to about 440 million years ago to the late Ordovician. But why is that transition so important? Because that transition involves, um, involves a transition to um, uplands and islands. Now it looks like a couple of my slides didn't make it, but that's okay. I'm on my own computer and I will just open up a previous presentation that shows you doo, 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 what we should be looking at. So give me just a half a second. Let that load. Shot sharing very quickly. I apologize. There we go. And then I can just, whoops, share the screen really fast. Hit this share button. The advantage of teaching is you get so used to screwing up a presentation that it doesn't even phase you anymore. So, um, <laughs> so I knew that I had lost a couple of slides, but apparently, weren't quite the slides that I thought I had lost. Excellent. So I talked about the same thing once upon a time about the middle Ordovician and the light eco ecosystems that we see there. So um, we didn't see, there were no fish during the Ordovician. Fish didn't evolve until much later. Fish didn't get really common until, for example, the Devonian, okay? So we don't start really seeing fish until the Devonian. Um, so there are no fish there. We also didn't see stony corals. Stony corals evolved and became prevalent in Cenozoic waters, which started about 65 million years ago. So we saw a coral reef system, but it was very different. Coral reef, if you looked at the top of the water, it would look very, very much like this right here. It looked like the modern Caribbean. But if you went underneath the water, you would see something very different. So I love these these series of photos here because they um, they really bring home that you know you're just basically moving around in time. So right here, this is a picture of the Black River today, just off of JCC's campus. This is a place that I usually in a normal year um, would take a whole bunch of students down there go hunting for fossils because there's actually some really cool fossils there right by the overpass over this, uh, the highway bridge right over here. So this section of Watertown right here looked like this 465 million years ago. It's definitely a coral reef, but it's a really different coral reef environment with some organisms that are either extinct today or much less prevalent today. So, one of the big organisms that you find in those in uh, along the Black River Trail and exposed in a lot of the black uh, bedrock along the Black River are these nautiloids. And these can actually get pretty tremendously huge. Um, I've had some people tell me they get up to six feet, which is possible. I don't know if if we actually find those in the Black River Valley. I don't think that's that's actually been documented in, in the limestone around here. But nautiloids actually got enormous. And the reason we care about nautiloids is that nautiloids are basically the top predators, the sharks of this ancient ocean. So this right here, okay, you can see these chambers in here. These chambers, okay, are basically on the inside of this long tube right here. Now here it's showing a nautiloid laying on the ground. I don't know exactly why artists I don't think artists actually like talk to the paleontologists because nautiloids were active swimmers. Nautiloids actually exist today. There are four species of nautiloids 
that are alive today, um, sadly, they're being wiped out by human by human hunting, not to eat them, but for the curio collect, um, market. In other words, for, for collectibles, because the shells are really pretty and they tend to be these really long, cool coils. So uh, there are nautiloids still around today. So we do have a modern analog that can tell us how these things move. So these chambers in here were basically gas chambers that the, the nautiloid used to change pressure in. And the changes in pressure, just like the changes in pressure inside a submarine, allowed the nautiloid to move up in the water column and allowed the nautiloid to move down in the water column. So more and larger, you get a better, better sense of how big these are. And I'm sure a lot of you have found, if any of you enjoy hiking along the Black River um, or have actually taken a look at the rocks along the Black River, that you have seen these types of critters living along the Black River, or not living, but in the rocks along the Black River. So this is what these look like during life. Now, another really common fossil that you'll find along the Black River is a gastropod, which is a fancy schmancy way of saying snail. So you, particularly when you go out to Whaley, you'll find huge piles of gastropods. And gastropods were an important part of the ecosystem because they were one of the prey animals for the nautiloid. Now, this is a particularly small sample. Brachiopods are so common in almost all the Black River limestone. So for example, I have a piece of Black River limestone right here. Get out of presentation mode. this entire piece of limestone right here is nothing but solid layers of little brachiopods. Now, in some areas, you can end up with like big, you know, silver dollar sized brachiopods. Um, these layers of really tiny, tiny brachiopods may have been caused by low oxygen environments that would allow, the reason we see so many brachiopods like concentrated in certain layers is that there may have been a decrease of oxygen during time periods. And brachiopods are still around today. They're very rare. The dominant, um, they look like, they look a little bit like clams and mussels and that kind of stuff, but they're actually a completely different phylum. They're a really different branch of life, even though superficially they look really, really similar. Um, one of the great things about brachiopods is that they adapt to low oxygen environments pretty well. So one idea is that we see layers that are rich in these tiny brachiopods because those tiny brachiopods could survive during periods of low oxygen. Let's go back to screen share. Do, do, do. All right. So these little brachiopods, other creatures that you might see, um, trilobites, they're not as common as uh, a lot of people seem to think they are. Um, um, also bryozoans, which are these stick-like shaped, hang on a second, this is the advantage of teaching someone that. Um, these are stick-like shaped Bryozoans are these crazy, I'm actually in my laboratory at JCC. I'm so grateful to be able to teach inside my lab. I've never been so grateful as I have been during COVID when I got kicked out of here and I was like, I miss my lab. So um, bryozoans, you can see it on the camera right here, are these crazy stick-like looking things. And these guys win for art fossils brought to my lab that cause the greatest arguments, barring lumpy pieces of limestone that kind of look like a dinosaur head to someone. There are no dinosaurs in Watertown. Um, I know that's disappointing, but there's no bedrock that's Mesozoic age around here. Glaciers chewed that all up, I'm sorry to say. But if you look at these brachiopods, these are colonial organisms. Uh, I think they're just as cool, uh, that look like sticks. So people will bring this into my lab and they will tell me, 
Dr. Eby, I am absolutely convinced that this is a preserved plant. The problem is there were no land plants during the Ordovician. So if they found it in Watertown, trust me, this is definitely not a plant. So these are one of the organisms, um, once again, bryozoans is a whole phylum. So it's a huge range of different organisms still around today, but they're not a dominant reef building organism like they were during the Ordovician. That's once again, stony corals that are dominant today. So I am going to go back to share the screen. Aha. So this is all during the middle Ordovician. So one of the things that uh, we need to think about is how that environment changed over time. So over here, we have the Taconic Highlands. During, through the middle of the Ordovician, through into the late Ordovician, the land to the east of us was gradually rising due to what's called the Taconic Orogeny. And an orogeny is not a dirty word, even though it kind of sounds like it. What it means is it is a mountain building event. So this is a, a um, this is when we basically had a chain of islands that slammed into the eastern side of North America. And what it's doing is exactly what we see in places that are that are still tectonically active today, like the Himalayas, that squeezing as the two plates slammed into each other causes the land to wrinkle and rise up. That causes the formation of mountains. So one of the things to get in, to kind of wrap your head around to really understand the history of this environment is that offshore environments tend to be muddy and shaly. We have some shale, okay? This is this flat rock right here. This is what we see in Whetstone Gulf. One of the things I've learned in the North Country is that anything kind of platy that breaks into layers is, is called shale. So, but this is actual shale. So what this is made out of, this, this particular is an oil shale. It's very dark. And this is exactly the same kind of shale that you'll see in Whetstone Gulf. And what formed this was is a bunch of layers and layers of mud that's very different from this beautiful quartz sandstone here, which is made from straightforward sand grains. Now, why do we get shale in some places and sandstone in others? That has to do with a pattern that we call the sedimentary facies concept. So sedimentary facies means that in certain types of depths and environments, you're going to see certain types of sediments collect and therefore certain types of uh, rocks forming. So has anyone kind of started at the beach and started walking out into the water? Anybody ever done that in your life? Like you start at the beach and then you just march out into the water. Yes, thank you, Linda. Awesome, thank you, Jen, thank you, Sue. I appreciate when people humor me. Um, I'm not a little humoring. Oh, I'll be a little more weathered. Um, <laughs> one of my samples dropped. So, um, so as you walk out, have you ever noticed what happens, what gradually happens to the feel of the sand as you get deeper and deeper and deeper? Where is the muddy stuff? Does it tend to be on the beach or does it tend to be deeper? Deeper, yeah. So that's something that, I mean, it's something that you can notice if you go swimming, you know, and you scoop up some, some mud from the deep, it tends to be a lot muddier and a lot finer than the stuff that we see on the shore. So where you have a lot of wave action going on, you're going to tend to have sandier material deposited. Just a little offshore, you're going to tend to see more muddy material deposited. Now, why does that matter in the context of Tug Hill? Well, because when you move up Tug Hill, you move forward in time, but you're also moving towards the shore. So this limestone is a little bit deeper off of the coast. 
then the shale represents an environment that is a little bit closer to the shore, but still offshore environment, muddier. And then the top, this cap right here of Oswego sandstone, that represents a near shore beach environment. When you find sand here on the top of Tug Hill, you are literally looking at a beach that's about 440 million years old. So, as we're moving forward up the up up Tug Hill, um, uh, we see these different changes in these faces. Now, a good question is what's causing that, and what's fundamentally causing this? The reason we're getting more and more offshore is that the land is gradually lifting due to the formation of these tectonic highlands. As the tectonic highlands push up, that causes the land to rise up. And it's basically pushing that land, that patch of land, gradually up out of the water. Now, that's important for the formation of the Tug Hill Plateau because the Tug Hill Plateau itself isn't a mountain. The Tug Hill Plateau um, isn't really an artifact of any pushing or squeezing or even a blister like we see with the Adirondacks. What happened was this sandstone right here is really resistant to erosion. Whereas this shale, I mean, I just had proved it. When I dropped it, this stuff is so soft, you can break it with your hands. Like you can, you can snap shale off with your hands. Now a glacier is a mile or two of solid ice that has giant boulders embedded in its belly. As that giant piece of ice rolls over the land, it's going to chew away just about everything that's that's even a little bit soft. So the shale in most of these areas has been kind of chewed away. But in the case of the Tug Hill Plateau, we have this patch of sandstone that was made out of quartz and was much, much harder than a lot of the surrounding bedrock. So that this little basically sandstone hat on the top of Tug Hill protected it from the glaciers. The glaciers ran over it, but it, they couldn't cut into it as deeply as they could the shale and they could the softer sandstone. So I'm just going to leave it off here for right now. I actually went longer uh, than I intended. So uh, I want to thank my audience and my college, which is SUNY Jefferson. I also want to thank um, uh, be, the folks that invited me to this conference, like Jen, um, Emily getting me in contact um, so that I could present. And I'm very happy to take any questions if anyone have any. What were the other formations on the top of uh, Tug Hill? And where's a good place to see the sandstone on the top of Tug Hill? Excellent, Jen. So here's a fantastic map produced by the New York State Geologic Highway System. If you are even dreaming of being a geologist, or even just doing it as a hobby, I would really recommend that you get. So let's get out of this thing. We don't need these pictures. They're not helpful. Let's take a look over here at this map right here. So the sandstone is right here. And that orangey stuff, um, uh, that's Queenston sh Shale. So. We'll get into what the orange. So I think who said the orangey? What are the other formations on the top of the hill? I'm talking about this orangey stuff right here, right? Um, uh, Jen. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So let's do Emily's really quick, and then we'll do Jen's question right here. So thank you, Sue. It's kind of it's kind of hard doing this. <laughs> I like to hand you rocks. I kept on wanting to be like. Take my rock, but you can't take my rock. Anyways, so um, so we have this this um, looking at the question again. Uh, the sandstone exposed up here, so it looks like Redfield, Orwell, um, and basically where which highway is this? It does not say on my map. I'm literally checking the map. I'm doing what I would do in my lab, which is my deal. I have not memorized all these places. So yeah, so like or Orwell, Redfield, Asosolia, Asosolia, 
O-S-C-E-O-L-A. So those are the towns in that area. So we could see it at the bottom of the Redfield Reservoir. I don't know how deep that reservoir is. So, um, but you might be able to, you would probably see sandstone exposed. You may also see other units exposed as well, however. Osceola, thank you, Jen. So I felt very silly pronouncing um, Lowville as Lowville when I first came here. I'm very sorry, people from Lowville. I now know that is not okay to say. <laughs> Osceola, so Osceola, Redfield, um, Orwell area is where you're gonna see that, that, that sandstone. Now that shale is part of the Quinston Shale. So let's continue on with that wonderful story of the rise of the Taconic Highlands. So the Taconic Highlands is basically this big belt over here. We still have portions of the mountains remaining, but they've been really, really, really eroded down over the past 465 million years or so, 440 million years. So as this land moved up, this whole area in here became a giant island with, and I mean, it's huge, absolutely. I mean, think about basically the entirety of the Eastern portion of New York state. Now, as that island expanded, it developed things like rivers. So we ended up with um, what's called the Queenston Clastic Wedge, which is basically what this, this shale right here at the top, that orangey stuff is a part of. So that has, at that point when this was formed, it was so high up that it was depositing, it had rivers in it, and it was basically creating like a massive delta system. We talk about in geology, the Catskill Deltas. So when you think of the Catskill Mountain region, that entire region was built up by deposits from a um, from, from rivers that were running across this island that was formed as the mountains uh, rose. What did the sand originally erode from? Paul, that is a great question. So most sand that we see, including this sand, is from deeper basement, what we say, we call it basement, crystalline rock. And that's that rock that we see in the Adirondacks. That's that, that granity stuff and that Nisic stuff that's basically underneath all the sandstone shales and sedimentary rocks we see down there. So if you dig down deep enough, anywhere in the state of New York, you're gonna find these two rocks. So most of the sand that we see here in actually over most of the world is actually weathered granite. Why? And, and nice. Why is that? Because there's so much of it because this is what the continents are made of. That sand is actually made almost like if you look at a pure quartz sandstone like this, this quartz in here is from the quartz that's inside the um, inside the original granite. And what's even cooler is that this shale, okay, is once again a byproduct of the weathering and erosion of the granite. It's the micas and the feldspars. So the micas and the Granite is made of three minerals. Backing it up a little bit. Granite is made of three minerals, quartz, mica, and feldspar. As it breaks down, the quartz is really hard. So it tends to form, stay big, hard grains and form things like white, sandy, quartzy beaches like we see with the sandstone right here. Whereas um, over here, we have um, the, the, the micas and the feldspars can undergo th processes like hydrolysis. And so they break down into this clay, muddy material that when that's subsequently deposited, when that's deposited in the future, it becomes a shale. So earth is basically a giant granite sifting system where some kind of process, some kind of tectonic process or something like that big mantle pillow or mantle plume pushes the granite that makes up the continental cores closer up to the surface. Then Earth does her work. He does, does rain, snow, all the weathering processes, just straight up old gravity, root wedging, frost wedging, all of that breaks down the granite and it begins its journey. As the chunks of granite begin their journey, I love it. 
this is a conglomerate. If you look at towards the base of a mountain, you'll find things like this conglomerate right here. And you can see that the granite in it and the gneiss is only partially broken down. So you can find a lot of these kinds of conglomerates in riverbeds near the base of mountains. So we actually find this as part of that whole Catskill Delta system. Now, if those kind of gravelly type things keep on getting bounced around, you bounce down even farther. And you're left with just fine grains of quartz, which tend to be deposited on the beach. And then that really broken down feldspar and mica that gets traveled out to the deep ocean. So basically it's like earth is smearing out the granite where it's separating the quartz and the micas and the feldspar along beaches and coastlines all over the world. So it's basically, it's, it's a big granite processing system. So, um, so that, that is where sakiloclastic, basically silica rich sediments come from. So did I answer your question? I probably did a little too much. I have a tendency to do that. So any other good or yeah, Paul? Did I catch it or no? So the sand that's deposited on Oswego weathered and eroded. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Where it wore away from the Taconic Mountains as they rose during the Ordovician. Yes, but if there was a beach, there was a highland here, right? It wasn't, it wasn't the mountainy part. Like picture, it wasn't like Hawaii, but picturing it for at least sedimentary reasons, picture Hawaii, where you have like this peak and then it slopes down and then you have like a wider, more gradual slope going out from it. It was a little bit like that totally different process. Hawaii is a hot spot. This is an orogenic belt, which means we have two continents sliding in, slamming into each other and lifting up the mountain. Um, but when you're talking about the sedimentary part of it, kind of the same. So the rocks and stuff fell down the mountain and collected near the base. That's what we call that clastic, Queenston clastic wedge. And then it kind of accumulated due to rivers, accumulated along the beaches and was eventually moved deeper out to sea by wave action. Does that kind of make sense? Hopefully, let me know. Yes, as a kid, I used to collect lots of fossils in the shale stream just north of Whetstone Gulf. I've been to Whetstone Gulf and I've never really gone fossil collecting there because none of the people I went with were patient enough for me to just kind of like crawl over the rocks with my little rock hammer. And I really, really, really want to do that. So um, Emily, so um, Corrigan Road Hill, Corrigan Hill Road will do it for you. Awesome. So let's do a program, right? I don't know if we can do it with COVID, but yeah, we should. So um, Jen, I saw you raised in your hand. Oh, I was saying, yeah, let's do a program. Let's do a field trip. Let's yeah. do a field trip. There's no reason not to. I, I Field trip is legit my favorite word. My favorite two <laughs> words put together is field trip. So other questions, we could video you. I'd appreciate that. Actually, during COVID, it's even more useful because I'm finding myself doing videoing myself on a lot of field trips. This is Morak. This is me on my YouTube. This is Morak. <sighs> So other questions. Oh, thank you, Nichelle. I yeah, come to JCC, learn more. Come to go to Potsdam. Potsdam has some really great. I got to do a shout out. Potsdam has some a really good geology department as far as teaching is concerned. So um, they've got a lot of enthusiastic presenters. You're very welcome, Sue. So happy to answer any more questions. While we're waiting, I, I would love to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming back, for walking us through part two. Um, it was even more fascinating and uh, for me, it even made more sense because I'm more familiar with this side of the valley, but That's awesome. um, hopefully we'll come back again. Hopefully we'll do it in person. We'll, we'll have a field trip as part of the conference some way, somehow. Um, 
Thank you. I, I, Thank I you. I, mean, I, had a, I had a great time. You mentioned being able to see the mantle uh, in that Adirondacks. I'm not sure, quite sure what to ask, but please expand. So you guys might need to turn up the volume because I'm going to need to use the chalkboard real quick. So okay. So I'm going to use the chalkboard. Can you guys hear me? If I shout, can you hear me? Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to use the greatest piece of technology, the chalkboard. So we've got ourselves the layers of the earth, right? We've got the crust like this, and I'm having it bowed out, and then I'm going to have, we're going to call this portion underneath this the lithospheric mantle. Gonna make this nice and bowed. So a lot of people seem to think that you can't see that. Let's make this, let's make lithospheric mantle pink because maybe you can see that then. Call that lithospheric mantle. And then down here we have the mantle or a deeper mantle. I have geologist friends that would be like, that's not deep, but it's deeper than the lithospheric mantle. So you, if you, you probably learned in school or it's a good chance you learned in school that the plates are made out of crust. We now know that's not actually 100% true. The plates are actually made out of most, all the crust, but a good chunk of the mantle right underneath that. So the pieces of the earth that go sliding around in plate tectonics are called the lithosphere. So this big chunk right here, from here to here, that's the lithosphere. Now, this is bowed up. This is gonna be our Adirondacks. Trying to make it bold so you can see it, okay? These are Adirondacks. So early in the stages, it bowed upwards, right? So it's been doing that for 5 million years. Then about 2.5 million years ago to about 11,000 years ago, glaciers went through and it went, nom, 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 So what happened was that as they went through and as they gobbled up, these top layers over here, it basically cut the top part of it off. And if you go to the high peaks area, you can see this portion of the lithospheric mantle. You'll see like what's called anorthrosite, which is this dark, dark metals rich rock with big, big crystals that is actually a part formed deep down inside the earth. It's just exposed because the, the, the lithosphere bowed outright like this, and then glaciers basically chopped the top off of um, uh, the, um, the high peaks area, and actually the entirety of the Adirondacks. So I was out on Mount Arab, and we were basically like over in this area right here, essentially, where we saw a lot of like transitional material, like metamorphosed diorite which is more mafic and therefore deeper from deeper portions inside the earth. So we were looking at basically the bottom of the crust being exposed out there towards the Adirondacks, or I'm sorry, out towards um, Mount Arab. If you get further into, I can even show you on the map, if you get further into the high peaks area, where is my map? So we see this like really pale section right here. See that light colored stuff? That's the anorthrosite. That's the portion of the, the lithospheric mantle that's exposed when you get that really, really mafic type stuff. So I hope Oh, we got we got a couple of questions. Hang on. Uh, did I answer your question, Kate? Well, 
one new message. Yes, awesome. Yay. So let's go up. Um, oh yeah. The, thank you very much. I'm glad you're interested in the other other part of the presentation. Um, are the gulfs in Cub Hill cut into the shale layers? Yes. So those gulfs um, um shale because basically anything that's underneath that sandstone hat. Any of that exposed shale is very soft and very easily damaged by rivers, glaciers, you name it. So it breaks down very easily. And I mean, you can, I mean, and if you've been in Whetstone Gulf, you can feel that you can pull this stuff apart. So imagine like a mile of ice with, with giant boulders embedded in the bottom of it, like a mile of ice with big boulders in the bottom, just grinding through that. It just, just ate through that shale material. And you see those in the, you know, those big gulfs. Um, a lot of that's also river erosion um, because it's so soft, the river can just carry away that shaley, shaley, flaky material. So other, ooh, let me scroll up. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Any more questions? I'm covered in pink chalk because I was a glacier <laughs> on my chalkboard. I'm really glad, I'm really glad. And Jen has my contact info. I'll also put it right here, my email. Thank you. Uh, my students like the sound of glacial omnoms. Um, I'm just going to put my email uh, in the in the message box right there. So if you think of a question or you want something expanded on or you really seriously want to work on a field trip or something like that, you have my contact information. It's actually easier than remembering for me to bring my cards. Not everything about COVID sucks, so it's right there in the chat. So if you're um, if you need it, it's, you got it, and Jen's got it. So so. There you go. So you're very welcome. And I appreciate everyone that came. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll be, they'll get this recording on our website very soon. Oh, I got to go check that out. Yeah. So Emily, you and I need to take a little mini field trip before we plan a big one for people to come with us. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to sign off. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool.